Hello, my name is Dimitris Kantikas, and this is my partner, Samantha Murata. And today we will be discussing chapters four through eight from Civil Editions and its discontents by renowned Austrian neurologist and psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud. Now, before we begin our lecture, I would like to say one thing. The concepts and ideas that Freud discusses are always very controversial. Freud himself, multiple times, goes back and forth between different points of view in his own ideas. So, before we begin this, I would like you to know that not everything that Freud says in this book and that we discuss is 100% accurate or set in stone. And everything needs and must be taken with a grain of salt so you can see the different points of views that Freud himself tries to discuss in his chapters. So with that in mind, let's begin. In the first chapter, and as we start chapter four, Freud discusses his belief on how primitive society was formed. He believed that primitive society was formed based on eros and anagi, which translates to love and necessity. Love between a man and a woman and the necessity for each member to do their own part in society. Now, there's two different viewpoints on this. His first point is aim inhibited affection. When Freud talks about aim inhibited affection, he talks about the love that founded civilization itself. A love that exists above the carnal needs between men and women, a love that surpasses the sexual concept of love. It's the love that binds people for a common goal. It's the love that creates bonds and friendships. It's the love that is the basis of civilization, but said love is not perfect and there is issues. The first issue that arises is family versus community. You see, Freud goes and discusses that it's very hard for a member of a family to detach itself, especially when they're young. And that's the main issue that arises when, how does a member stop seeing himself and loving only his family and become a member of the greater community? Well, he does discuss that that's usually done through puberty or initiation rites, but that is one of the main tensions, family versus civilization. And the second tension he discusses in great depth is women versus civilization, or let's be more honest, women versus men. For Freud, women are the head of the family. They represent family, and that's what they're all about. The problem is that he sees the men as the ones responsible for building civilization. And since men need to do that, they spend less time being fathers and husbands and spend more energy satisfying the needs of civilization, essentially lacking on the department of their family. This, in turn, makes women hostile and angry towards society since men are no longer paying attention to their family and taking care of them. Which brings us to male sex drive. Now, Freud makes it very clear that the male sex drive, the libido, the, the, the need to, for a sex partner is the very basis of love. He believes that sexual love was what started it all. But sexual love is not perfect. He believes that even though sexual love is a, is a, is a concept that could work, it's very straightforward and intimate, and it does you know, start a family and, and function, he does believe that a love based strictly on the sexual needs of one person is bad because when said person loses their partner or is rejected, they become emotionally unstable and they're not good either for themselves or civilization, which brings us to his second train of thought. The idea that happiness doesn't come from sex. The idea that happiness doesn't come from, you know, being loved, but for loving others. But even with this concept, Freud, once again, has a huge issue because indiscriminate love on Freud's eyes loses its own value. And to be honest, as Freud puts it, not all men are worthy of love, which brings us to the main point civilization and sex. Based on Freud, the very first thing he says is that civilization restricts sexual activity. This can be seen from all kinds of societies, no culture, but in one way or another, 
civilization wants to restrict sexual activity because the less energy people spend on having sex, the more energy can be placed into building our society. And this is where he raises one really good question. Is this the best way to do things? Is this the best thing for humanity? Should we all just go ahead and give on to our carnal needs and have sex with everyone? Is, is, that, is that a good idea? And by doing that, do we become happy? Well, he doesn't answer it. But he does go into great detail about it in chapter number five. Now, in chapter number five, he starts by saying that people naturally want to bond with someone. We're all seeking a partner to usually satisfy our sexual needs. But civilization doesn't like that. Civilization doesn't like it when two couples only care about themselves and nothing else. Civilization wants those two couples to put their energy not into each other, but into civilization itself. And then comes another question. To what extent and how much does a couple need one another? So a couple that's madly in love at the beginning cares about no one else. But the question is, should they? Should they care about someone else? And if so, to what extent? So Freud goes on to discuss a few ways on how uh, religion, sex and religion, play a role into this as well. He goes on a very lengthy uh, ideal of talking about one main commandment, thou shalt love your neighbor as thyself. He believes that this concept is much older and predates Christianity, but he straight up rejects it. He says that this is a concept that was made by civilization and has no basis of standing for multiple reasons. For example, though our neighbors deserve our love, isn't love something valuable? Why should I give it to my neighbor? By giving love to my neighbor, am I not robbing my family of it? And you know, what if my neighbor is a horrible human being? What if he wants to kill me? What if he tries to rob me? What if he, you know, steals my cow as he did back in the day? Does he deserve my love? So here's where another question rises. Is love a finite substance? Is there an amount of love we have? Or can we just love everyone? Does a person go ahead and say, okay, I can only love my wife, my three kids, my dad, my mom, that's it. Everybody else, I have no more love. And that's what Ford wants to discuss. How much love is there? And then he discusses the polar opposite humans being bad. And he does this by using the example of the wolf. Now, a very famous and very good quote in the book is the quote of, the Latin quote of homo homini lupus, man is wolf to man. This is the concept that men are naturally cruel. We hate on each other. And he has plenty of examples, wars, capital punishment, torture, so many examples that Humans are not nice to each other. Humans don't love each other. And similarly to how civilization has to stop one's man's sexual drives in order to function, they also have to stop one's aggressive drives. And how he does so is using or through the concept of aim inhibited love. But of course you'll ask me, well, this is how our society works. What about a different society that's different from ours? Well, Freud talks about that too, through communism. Now, communism is a very old concept from Karl Marx and whatnot. And Freud doesn't bother himself with the uh, you know, economic parts of communism or how it worked or, or how it's going to do. But he does talk about the main ideas of it. He talks about how in communism, everybody's equal. How in communism, nobody owns land. And he believes that maybe... It's this idea that, you know, one man having more than another or private property, ownership, money is what makes us hostile to each other. And if, you know, everybody was equal, well, then hostility would end. But he does explain that this is nothing but an illusion. You see, even if we change the circumstances around aggression, he believes that we cannot change human nature itself. And men will just be cruel and angry at each other no matter what and goes on to ask what if the same way 
communism removes private ownership, what if we removed sexual restriction from society? Would that give us a more happy society? Would it give us more freedom? Would that be better off? Well, Freud, as he always does, goes back to his idea of the primitive man. He states that, you know what? Maybe primitive man was happier. Maybe primitive man was the happiest man wherever will ever be. But that's not the case. He does mention that even in primitive societies that can be studied today, we can see that social restrictions were still there. That certain bonds and certain alliances were formed where they're not exactly free to do as they want. He further on states that civilization traded happiness for security and stability. And he does use an example. And the example he uses is American civilization. And from what he writes, he doesn't go into great detail about American civilization, but one thing is for sure, he's not a huge fan, as he states that American civilization needs to be studied in order to understand the damage that has been done to humanity through this concept of stability and security in need of our happiness. And maybe, just maybe, if we remove said bonds of sexual frustration and aggressiveness, maybe we can create a better society. But once again, he just mentions it and he never truly goes to great depth on how something like that could be ever achieved. And from that, I'll pass it on to my partner. Hi, so for chapter six, Freud takes his time to reintroduce and re-emphasize some of the earlier materials and concepts he's mentioned in the previous chapters. He also uses this chapter to take time to acknowledge that he uses other psychoanalyst thoughts. For example, he mentioned he uses Friedrich Schuyler's. So let's talk about Freud's main points in chapter six. This begins with the concept of love and hunger in mankind. Beginning with the definitions of hunger and love defined by Freud, hunger is the concept that represents instincts that aim to maintain the preservation of an individual. Basically, and in much simpler terms, this means that it acts like a motivation that protects a person and this person only. This also feels into what Freud calls the ego instincts. And moving on to love, Freud defines this as the need to seek for objects in order for the preservation of a species. He mentions that love really is an impulse for anything that is greater than the individual by itself. And this idea of love feeds into his idea on libido. The idea of hunger and love and ego and object instincts allude to Freud's theory, theory that when the two conflict, or the two theories conflict, it creates major problems, especially mentally. Continuing in this chapter, Freud goes on to reintroduce new concepts such as sadism, narcissism, and the psychosis. And these are really important concepts to remember. So I'm going to give you a few of the definition he uses before giving any much further explanation. So libido is an antithesis that was formed between the ego instincts and the libidinal instincts that is directed towards objects. And these objects, for example, could be love. Also, it's important to understand moving forward that sadism and the sadistic come from the object instincts. However, Freud spends most of this chapter discussing narcissism and libido and how it doesn't only focus on the ego in individuals itself. Narcissism is the idea that libido mentally concentrates on the ego and that its first dwelling place is actually in the ego and that the later remains to some extent in the is its permanent headquarters. He uses the concept of narcissism to stem that traumatic neurosis and other various diseases that involves the involves the psychosis and or the psychoanalytic angle can come from this. Most importantly in this chapter, Freud talks about the death instinct. This concept completely goes against what he's mentioned earlier with Euros and how it, it is the phenomena of life. Key part of Euros is it's being part of life. He discusses how the death instinct has definitely been rejected by others, especially by other psychoanalysts, because there has been no proof that proves this theory. 
key note and arguably the most important aspect of the death instinct itself is that Freud uses it to explain that there is aggression within every single person and that this aggression includes being towards others and even themselves. Keep in mind that death instinct and Eros is intertwined and that the aggression that Freud mentions can actually be found in sadism because it is when the erotic drive or the sexual game of cruelty becomes mixed with aggression towards others. This is why learning and understanding the concepts of sadism and the new concepts he's mentioned earlier are really important. Moving on to chapter seven, Freud in this chapter really ties in the role of aggression and how it takes part in civilization. He uses the concept of superego, the death instinct, aggression, guilt, and punishment to really get his points across. He then spends the majority of the chapter explaining how conscience and a person's views on good and bad play a major role. He really emphasizes that people take this very seriously because it jeopardizes their ability to keep and especially not lose other individuals who may be vital for their success in civilization. He also talks about the sense of guilt, which is the tension between the strict superego and the subordinate ego. This also contributes to the idea of punishment and overall the sense of guilt comes from people who do bad things and then feel guilty or secondly, being guilty because they were part of something bad. Good versus bad depends on the person and how they were raised, especially by parents and their society. Using guilt, Freud introduces the paradox, which in basic terms is when individuals suffer from the guilt and anxiety. He argues that this leads to unhappiness and tensions. He then summarizes that the idea of sense of guilt and the paradox is an overwhelming vicious cycle that affects people and their egos in civilization. And finally, the last chapter, chapter eight. So Freud actually starts this chapter in a sort of joking matter and tries to be kind of funny. He takes his time to apologize to his readers for having such a long explanation for all his thoughts and how it basically took up a whole book, especially eight chapters. He then expresses that how he knows how readers may at this point still probably don't understand fully of what he's saying or they have many questions. He continues with the idea of sense of guilt and how it will still and most probably continue to be one of the most important and problematic concepts contributing to society. He also uses this chapter to bring in religion, specifically Christianity. He argues that in a way, Christians understand that the role of sense of guilt in society, and more specifically that how Christians view and call this as sin. Chapter eight was strategically used by Freud to reiterate and tie together all his concepts and theories he's mentioned before in attempt to make his readers really understand and grasp his concepts. Again, he talks about the superego, conscience, sense of guilt, need for punishment and remorse and how they affect individuals and civilization. And for the purpose of without sounding too repetitive or too tedious or making this lecture too long, I included in this slide what they are and their definitions. So feel free to review, review them or go over them, but I won't really go into much further detail or re-explain once again. So chapter eight also talks about the two contradictions by Freud, which is super important to remember and something I want to kind of leave chapter eight off on. Number one is being the sense of guilt and how it is the consequence of uncommitted aggressions and particularly how it is also the consequence of an aggression that has already been fulfilled. And this First contradiction actually involves the superego because it's radically altered. It also includes remorse discussed earlier, which is generally the reaction after an aggressive act. And the second contradiction being aggressive energy that comes from an individual who, who believes that the superego inhabit, inhibits authoritative energy but are not allowed to discharge its actions. So that was our presentation on Freud chapters four to eight, and we really hope you liked it and understood it. And we can't wait to read your responses. Thank you.